To tie up and summarize the last few videos on quantities related to electrical charges, we're now going to be talking about systems of charges. So if there's any interaction of charges with two or more charges. So we've already covered the case where we have two charges. So for example, if we have a positive charge Q1 and another positive charge Q2, we can find the potential at any point within this space, the electrical potential energy held within the system, and also the electrical field at any point within this space. But if we introduce a third charge, Q3, or even a fourth charge, Q4, we still want to be able to find these quantities. And so it turns out to find the net potential, potential energy, electrical field, it's simply adding the sum of the participation from each individual charge. But the way in you add the sum or how it's defined changes for each quantity and that's what we're going to go over. Before we start talking about the electrical potential at a point in space within a system of charges, we first need to define what the electrical potential is due to a point charge. So suppose we have a positive point charge, Q, and there is a point P around Q that we want to find the electrical potential. Now let's say we bring another charge, Q2, from infinity up to point P. We know that the electrical potential at point P is given by E divided by Q. And in this case, E is the electrical potential energy of the system such that Q2 can be at point P. So E is equal to the electrical potential energy that Q2 has to have, which is K times Q times Q2 divided by the distance between them, which we'll call R. That's the energy of Q2. And Q in this case is simply the value of Q2. So if we sub these in to our voltage equation, we get that V is equal to K times Q times Q2 divided by R, all divided by Q2. And so these two Q2s cancel out. And we find that the electrical potential at point P is equal to KQ divided by R. And so it does not depend what charge is at that location. It just depends what charge is creating the potential at that location. So if we have any point P around a charge, we can find the potential at that point, And it is simply equal to K times the charge divided by the distance between the charge and the point we're looking for. So when it comes to a system of charges, not a lot changes. If we want to find the electrical potential at point P in the system that we have here, so the electrical potential at point P, all we have to do is we have to sum the individual potential contributions from each charge and the equation for this we can say that the potential at point P is equal to the sum of the potentials from each charge which is equal to the potential from charge 1 We'll draw that like this, V1 plus V2 plus V3. So it's, since voltage is a scalar quantity, all you have to do is add them, but you just have to be careful from the signs. 
So we can see already that since Q2 is negative, it's going to give us a negative potential. And Q1 and Q3 are going to be positive, and so they're going to give us a positive potential. And so all we have to take care of is finding the magnitude and sign of these potentials and adding them together. So if we continue with our equation, V1 is going to be, according to our equation over here, it's going to be K times Q1 divided by the distance between Q1 and P is R1. Then we add the potential from Q2, which is K times Q2, but in this case, Q2 is negative. So we have negative Q2 divided by R2 in this case, because that's the distance between Q2 and P, plus K times Q3 divided by the distance between Q3 and P is R3. And that will be your electrical potential at point P for this system of charges. Now for electrical potential energy, the process is very similar. So suppose we have another system of charges where we have positive Q1, negative Q2, and another positive Q3. And we'll define the distance between Q1 and Q3 as R13, between Q1 and Q2 as R12, and between Q2 and Q3 as R23. Now in this case, we're trying to find the electrical potential energy, and so that's the energy contained by the system. Whereas the electrical potential refers to a location or a point in space around the system. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, to find the electrical potential energy, we know that our equation is EE is equal to K times Q1, Q2, divided by R. And so at any moment, we can only find the electrical potential energy for any two charges or any, two, any interaction between two charges. So this gives us the potential energy for an interaction of two charges. Or a pair. So what we'll do to find the electrical potential energy of a system is we'll find the sum of all pairs slash interactions for charges in the system. So in a way, you can imagine that you're going to be building up the system from the start. So as an example, with this system that we have above, what we'll do is we'll pick a charge to start with. So we'll pick Q1. Then we're going to have to bring Q2 from infinity to its current location. So we'll bring Q2 near Q1. And we'll bring it to a distance R12 from Q1. So at the moment, the sum of our electrical potential energies, or the net electrical potential energy, is equal to K Q1 Q2 divided by R12. Then we'll bring in Q3 from infinity to a distance R13 from Q1 and R23 from Q2. So now we have to add the potential energies for both these interactions. For this interaction between Q2 and Q3 and the interaction between Q1 and Q3. So we're going to add K times Q2, but Q2 is negative. So this is a negative quantity. K times negative Q2 times Q3 divided by R23 
plus k times q1 and q3 divided by r13. And a very simple way to write this is the pair, so the energy between 1, 2, the energy between 2, 3, and the energy between 1, 3. And if you wanted to simplify the above expression, you could factor out the k and simply write k, q1, q2 over r12 plus k negative, so we can simply write negative minus q2, q3, divided by r23, plus q1, q3, divided by r13. And usually in these problems, you'll either have some symmetry within the geometry, or within the charges themselves, maybe q1, q2, and q3 are all the same magnitude, or maybe these distances r12, r13, and r23 are all the same, and so you can simplify this even further, which we'll see in an example. And when it comes to electrical fields, which are, of course, vector quantities, we're going to have to add and, or sum these vectors to find the resultant vector. So suppose we have our positive Q1, positive Q2, and negative q3 and we have a point p somewhere in between to find the electrical field at point p we're simply going to sum all field contributions from the charges in the system So we know that since Q1 and Q3 or Q2 are both positive, they're going to create electrical fields radially outwards, so E1 and E2. And then Q3 is negative, so it's going to create an attractive electric field. And what we'll do to find the net electric field at point P is it's going to be the sum of all these contributions, so E1 plus E2, plus E3. And then you can add these vectors with whatever method that you're used to. So one way is to use the component method. So we'll have EX is equal to E1X plus E2X plus E3X. And then EY is equal to E1Y plus E2Y plus E3Y. And then you'll be left with the net electric field in both the x and y directions. So you'll have a field in the y direction and a field in the x direction. And then you can find the magnitude and direction of your sum or your net electric field, which would be something like this. And so your angle over here, which we can call theta, is going to be the inverse tangent of EY divided by EX. And the magnitude of the electric field at point P, you can use Pythagorean theorem. So it's going to be the square root of EY squared plus EX squared. And so all it comes down to is adding vectors. All right, now we're ready for an example. So we have a system over here, and we're told to find the electrical potential and the electrical field at point P, which is the center of a square in this case. And then we're told to find the total electrical potential energy contained within the entire system. So the corners of the square are all charges of magnitude Q equals 1 microcoulomb. And the side lengths are all 2R, where R is 1 meter. So our side lengths are 2 meters. So we'll start with the electrical potential in this case. So we'll denote that as VP. 
And as we said, that's just going to be the sum of all the contributions from the charges. So if we label this corner as 1, then this one, 2, 3, and then 4, then VP is going to be V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4. So if we expand this, V1 is going to be K, Q1. This distance that we'll call L, we can find using Pythagorean's theorem, since the left side is going to be half the side length of our side length of our square. So our square has side lengths of 2r, so this side is going to be r. This bottom side is also going to be half a side, so that's also going to be r. So this diagonal, which represents the distance between the charges and the center, is simply L equals the square root of r squared plus r squared, which is the square root of 2r squared, which is equal to root 2r. So it's going to be kq1 over root 2r plus k times, in this case, q2 is a negative. So negative q2 divided by also root 2r plus q3 is also negative. So k times negative q3 once again divided by root 2r plus k times q4 is positive over root 2r. Now what we notice is that all of these q1, q2, q3, and q4 are the same magnitude. So the magnitude of q1, q2, q3, q4 are all equal to q which is equal to 1 microcoulomb, so 1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. So what we can do is we can factor out k times q over root 2r. So q1 is positive, so that's we can label that with a positive 1. q2 is negative, so that's a minus 1. q3 is also negative, minus 1. And q4 is positive plus 1. So once we factor, it's pretty clear that we have a cancellation over here. Since we have 1 minus 1, which cancels, and the negative 1 plus 1 also cancels. So this entire thing is 0. So our electrical potential at this center point is going to be 0. So when you get symmetries like this, where you have an equal number positive and negative charges or their equal magnitude and they're the same distance away from your common point this type of symmetry will give you a zero electrical potential We should also note that the system doesn't necessarily need to be completely symmetrical in order for this to happen. For example, let's say we have two axes, y and x, and we want to find the electrical potential at the origin, so we'll call that our point P. Let's say we have a positive charge on the y-axis, so it's positive Q, and we have a negative charge on the x-axis, negative Q. And we'll say both of these Q's are the same magnitude. So once again, Q equals 1 microcoulomb. And we'll say they're also both the same distance away from this point P. So we'll call this R, this one R as well. And once again, R is going to equal 1 meter. And the potential at point P, since these are not vectors, is simply going to be their addition. So VP is once again the contribution from this first charge. So we'll call this Q1, we'll call this Q2. So it'll be V1 plus V2. V1 is going to be K times Q1. Q1 is just positive Q divided by R. 
and then v2 is going to be k and negative q since that's the value of q2 once again divided by r and so what we get is that this is equal to k divided by r times q our first q is positive so 1 our second q is negative minus 1 this inside region is 0 and so our sum or our total potential at point p is 0 volts so just as a note our system does not need to be completely symmetric now since we found the electrical potential at point p to be 0 so vp was 0 you might be tempted to say that this means the electrical field at point P is also equal to zero. But this is not necessarily the case because the field is a vector. And so the addition of vectors differs a lot from the addition of scalars. And so just because the voltage at point P was zero does not imply that the electrical field at point P is also zero. You're gonna have to verify. And so what we can do is once again add all the individual contributions. And so EP is equal to the sum of all the field contributions. So what we'll notice is that Q1, or we'll label the corners once again. So Q1 is going to have a radially outwards contribution. Q4 is going to have the same contribution, radially outwards. Now Q2 is going to have a inwards contribution in the same direction and magnitude as E4 because they're the same charge and same distance away from point P. And the same goes towards E3 or Q3. Now each one of these contributions in magnitude, so EI where I is 1, 2, 3, or 4, in magnitude is going to equal to K times Q divided by the distance, once again, we found was the square root of 2 times r. That's our distance, and we square it. So this is equal to k times q, or qi, if you will, divided by 2r squared. Now, since we have two of these forces, or two of these fields going the same direction, if we consider point p, in reality, we only have two fields where we can sum the contributions of Q4 and Q2. So 2, 4. And we can sum the contributions of Q1 and Q3. And each one of these E's is equal to two electric field contributions, which is equal to, in magnitude, KQ over r squared, since 2 will cancel with the denominator 2. And since these are in equal magnitude, and they're within a square, each of these angles is going to be 45 degrees. And so by symmetry, the y components cancel. So the electric field at point P is going to be equal to the sum of the x components. And both of these E's are equal, and they're equal to KQ divided by R squared. And so all we have to do is we multiply 2 times KQ over R squared times cosine of the angle, since we're trying to find the X component, which is related to the adjacent side. Cosine of 45 is 1 over root 2. So we get 2 divided by root 2 times KQ over R squared. And so if we sub in, we get 2 over root 2 times 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per coulomb squared times 1 microcoulomb, which is 1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, divided by r squared, which is 1 meter squared. And 
And since I'm running out of room, I'll write the answer to the left. If you plug that into your calculator, you get a final answer of 12.713 kilonewtons per coulomb. That is the net electrical field at point B. To find the total electrical potential energy of the system, we have to consider all the interaction pairs. As if we were building the system from the beginning. So if we label our corners again, we can start with Q1. And then we'll bring in Q2 from infinity. The distance between Q1 and Q2 is going to be 2R. And so, so far, my electrical potential energy is given by the energy contained between 1 and 2. Then we'll bring in Q3 from infinity. And this will have an interaction between Q2 and Q1. The distance in this diagonal is also given by Pythagorean's theorem. So distance is going to be the square root of 2r squared, which is 4r squared, and another 4r squared, which is the square root of 8r squared, which is simply root 8 times r. So this is root 8r. So now we can add to our potential energy the energy between charges 2 and 3, and the energy between charges 1 and 3. And then we can bring in Q4 from infinity. And this will have an interaction between Q1, between Q3, and also between Q2. So when we add that in, that's going to be E14 plus E24 plus E34. And if we expand this expression, E12 is going to be K, Q1, Q2, but Q2 is negative. So negative Q2, all divided by 2R, plus we'll have Q2 and Q3, so K, negative Q2, negative Q3, divided by 2r as well, plus e13, which is going to be k times q1, negative q3. In this case, we're looking at a diagonal, so that's going to be root 8r, plus we'll have all the interactions from q4, so k, q1, Q4 divided by 2R plus K Q4 and negative Q2 divided by the diagonal, which is root 8R. And finally, plus K times Q4 times negative Q3. And this is simply a side, so that's going to be 2R. Now we can factor to make our lives a lot easier. So all of these share a common factor of k. And they're all divisible by r as well. And what we can do is we can simplify this root 8 as being 2 root 2. So we can put a 2 here as well. And all of these k's, or all of these q's, are all equal to q equals 1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. So we have q times q repeated, so q squared. Now on the inside, our first one is going to be negative, so we'll label that with a negative one. And it's divided by 2, so we don't have to divide by anything. Our second one is going to be positive, since it's two negatives added together, so plus 1. Our third one is going to be negative, but it's going to be divided by 1 over 2 root 2r. We took care of one of the 2s, so what we do is we can multiply by 1 over root 2. Our fourth one is going to be positive, divided by 2. 
Our fifth one is going to be negative, but divided by 2 root 2, so 1 over root 2. And our last one is going to be negative and divided by 2, simply minus 1. What we'll notice is the first two cancel with each other. And then this guy over here cancels with this guy. So what we're left with is kq squared over 2r minus 2 over root 2. These twos cancel, and our final expression for the electrical potential energy of the entire system is kq squared divided by root 2r negative. And if we substitute, we'll get negative 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meters squared by coulomb squared. Q is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, all squared, divided by root 2 multiplied by r, which is 1 meter. And if you plug that into your calculator, you'll get a final answer of negative 6.35 or 3, 6 if you round it, times 10 to the negative 3 joules. And that is the net electrical potential energy of the entire system.